we're starting off the day with a tutorial on reinforcement learning as an approach to AGI. So this is a different from the other tutorials in that it's not explaining someone's system, but it's, it, it's explaining a, the basics of an important body of, of knowledge for approaching AGI. And following the tutorial, we're going to have our, our third keynote by Alexander Wisner Gross presenting his ideas on causal entropic forces as a as a, a central <coughs> defining feature of, of intelligence. So, our presenter this morning is uh, Peter Sunhag, who is uh, he's originally he, he's from Sweden. He's been in Australia for some time and is a PhD student of. Marcus. Well, about a decade. Decade? Decade. Uh, decade. 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 Actually, he, he's done a lot, a lot of a very in, in, interesting work in, in these areas, and is now going to tell us about some of the of the foundations of, of, of this area of AGI, which he and and Marcus Suter and a number of others have, have been advancing. So, Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so yeah, I used to yeah, like Ben. I used to do my in my PhD in pure mathematics before then into artificial intelligence and machine learning. Matter worked in, now I've been reinforcement learning for several years, which we're going to tell you about today. I'm going to start at quite basic level. So, what is reinforcement learning and how is it connected to artificial intelligence? So, traditionally, AI tends to be about definitely known worlds, for example, the planning problem or some logical query problems and stuff. But this machine learning is quite different. It learns from data, mostly ID data. Sometimes it's a chunk of data, but then those chunks of IDs, but most of the IDs are producing the classification and direction of clustering. While well, reinforcement learning deals with the intersection of these two worlds, where we're going to have the most difficult situation, one of a stochastic unknown world with plenty of dependency. So that is where the real artificial intelligence problems really exist in that, in that intersection. There have been quite a few successes of reinforcement learning over the years. I'm going to say the first one is 1959, before I really talked that much about reinforcement learning. And that was by Samuel Pelicek's play, which uh, managed to use something very much like our methods of temporal difference learning today to create quite a good checkers uh, play on very, on very simple computers that day. It's something much more advanced and more recent has been this helicopter acrobatics at Stanford that and the young has done. So for example, you can keep hovering upside down, which is one of the most difficult tasks for some people doing helicopter acrobatics to do. But you can do this autonomously, and you can see a lot of videos on YouTube with it doing lots of other advanced acrobatics, which learns to be important. <coughs> now the more recent success is Computer Go, which used to be embarrassingly bad for artificial, be an embarrassment for artificial intelligence, and I couldn't even play as a reasonable club player, but Losing, but but huge jump in performance is of the upper confidence bounce applied to trees uh, in 2006 and now is playing at a strong master level. Other things are Rocket Cup Soccer, where Team Stone's team has won sometimes, Inter Management, Turning Cash, Simon, Elevate Control, uh, and a lot of robotics tasks, a lot of robotic robotics on the reinforcement turning. And a lot of other sort of board games. The best, the uh, best backgammon player in the world has been for by the reinforcement game. And more recently, we have the archive learning environment, where one has all the Atari 2600 uh, from long ago, and one has an emulator, and one has the 500 games that was made for that for that game. And one now has made a reinforcement learning environment where one can access all of those games as reinforcement learning tasks to solve and in a coherent framework. So that creates an uh, interesting challenge if you want to create more general artificial intelligence. All these other things are more specific. One has a specific task 
And uh, the target intelligence seems common. There was a quite large variability in the kind of uh, intelligence that you need to be able to solve the various sorts of tasks. But what they have in common is that they have the same screens, they have that pixel made, the, that pixel screen, and from that you can try to solve it. it based on the kind of cognitive skills that human beings have, because it's supposed to be solvable and fun for human beings to play this at target. And it has suitable resolution so that with today's computational resources, we can actually attack those problems. So that's a very interesting and growing popular in the last few years. A challenge for, for more general reinforcement learning agents, which is very relevant, very relevant for this community. We're going to talk a bit more about many of these things in a while after introducing some of the basic notions of reinforcement learning. So the situation is basically this one, we have some agent separate from some environment which are viewed as. The agent takes actions, it gets back an observation or in a simpler situation, the full state of the environment and the reward. So they're going to talk quite a while about a situation where you do get a full state and then I'm going to talk later on about how to map much more general problems to this situation to be able to use all the methods that have been developed and be successful for those applications and so on to deal with this situation. And we we'll, we'll, do we'll get state. So these go in cycles of the action state reward, and I'll try to accumulate as much reward as possible. So, reinforcement learning is an approach to artificial intelligence, among other things, and is learning from interaction with an environment, kind of goal oriented learning within it, to be this reward structure. So we're learning about the environment while interacting with it. So you are trying to learn what to do to achieve higher rewards. So we learn to map from situations to actions, what actions to perform, so to maximize this numerical reward signal over a longer period of time. So we thought that it connects to many fields. And one way is the way of seeing that I hadn't seen before. I saw it just two weeks ago at Mass site where Rick Sutton, one of the fathers of the field, were giving an invited talk. And he had two things about publications in reinforcement learning. One was a plot that looked almost exponential. And the other thing was a pie shot. And the pie shot was very interesting. It had a different fields where it, it, it told you what field those publications arrived in. And this little slice that was computer science and engineering. I myself used to think until two weeks ago that this would be the big slice of the whole thing. But apparently things like biology where I study at animal behavior, psychology has a lot more than I thought about some other work in psychology and reinforcement learning. In neuroscience, the TD updates are uh, explaining many uh, mechanisms based on dopamine. It connects to a control theory and operations research, which developed a bit before reinforcement learning, as well as to the field of artificial neural networks. That is what Sam Dr. Bendis talked yesterday where he mentioned how you can use deep learning together with reinforcement learning because it's becoming a big a big area to solve for certain these targets. So key features of reinforcement learning that distinguish it to some other areas like traditional machine learning is that the learning is not told which action to take. So it's not like supervised learning. You can input, you get told what the output is supposed to be. But there is an output what you have to learn to do and you do it by trial and error. We also have possible delayed rewards. We don't immediately find out is actually a tool was a good idea or not. It might take quite a while before you find out. For example, if you play a game, you might not find out until the end if you won the game or not, and then you have to try to decide a credit back and find which actions were good actions and which were not so good. So you set up short term games, great long term games, and you have the exploration of those expectation problem, which is a big fundamental problem of the reinforcement term. You don't find out what the other actions would have led to. You only find out what happens with the action you actually took. So, you, you, so that's the only thing on supervised learning. Then you, when you see the truth, you know what the area would have been for all the different options that you could have taken. But here you only find out the reward for what, what you actually did. So you need to try a lot of alternatives to find a good model of the world and try to find out what good things are to do. If you only exploit the knowledge you have so far, you probably get, you get stuck in some optimal behavior. For example, hiding in some corner of the world to avoid the negative reward you saw very early on in your experiences. So, this set of supervised learning gives some inputs. You're supposed to choose some output. 
and you do find out the error of this telling what it did, and you do know what the error would have been with other options as well. Uh, and you do find out what the desired output would have been. So in our system, you also have input and output. You don't find out what you should have done, and you only find that there was what you actually did. And then what you did affects what happens next. It affects what state the environment would be next, which is also different from the ID assumption in supervised learning. What happens next for the next training set, what it really does not depend on what you have to do. So this makes it a lot harder problem, but it is a situation that general AI problem is actually the issue. So it does provide a formalization of general AI problem. Let me give you a concrete, quite simple example first to give you. Those are not familiar with reinforcement learning at all, and intuition for so not. So an example is example of tic tac toe, and it might be the axis. And then if someone has some component, for example, some computer program, it plays with it. So that is part of when we give it as a task in AI course, for example, is usually task with something like alpha beta search. And they try to find the minimax solution of the But it's human in perfect component. We in most of these board games are mentioned success, so we're going to play against highly perfect components. We play Go, we play chess, and so on. So in this case, we take this into account, we might be much, much more efficient, we might win positions that are really losing positions. If, if you do some optimal search, when you do have a losing position, everything is somewhat lost, so you don't distinguish between your actions. But if you see many perfect opponents, there's not difference between some moves you do and other moves you do, despite the fact that you are in objectively losing position. And then quite often we're in an objectively lost position. So important learning is good for this situation, where we implicit, I've explicitly implicitly learn a model of the component. So one way can be that we each position we try to have an estimate of the probability that we're going to win against the sort of opponents that we're playing against. If we do have that, we can take a decision based on that table because we want to go to the position where the highest probability of winning. So one way to run the table is to always have the next state with the highest estimate of winning. That is called a greedy move. So you learn what you use what you learned so far in a greedy manner. However, you might never discover that there's a better move to do than what you than what you tried so far in that position. Or you might see position only once, then you lost the game, and then you might, in this case, never ever agree to go to that position again. And you will never learn that that's a good position that you messed up later on. So instead, one should have some sort of exploration strategy, and a simple heuristic one is you have 10 percent of time to do random move, which is quite often used. The other more sophisticated, more systematic strategies, but very simple way of this called epsilon exploration. A certain amount of time you take a random. And you have to find out about other states that you lost otherwise go. Things so you think are bad, worse than other things, but it might actually be better if you investigate it again. So how are we going to learn that table? Well, we're starting with some table, for example, everything except for 50-50, or perhaps with zero probability of winning. And then as we get experiences, we want to along the way be as a play game, we want to be able to update these tables as you see them. So what you see in this slide is simple, the simple rule that you see in a position you end up in from the state, the going state, you take an action out of a new position, and you see what the table is saying at that point. And then you can decide to move your estimated S a little bit closer to the estimated S prime. For example, if you have 50% of winning at one table in position win, you take a move, then in that situation you have only 47 percent, perhaps you have to lower the probability in the initial one. So the question is whether this makes any sense at all. I mean, if, if the next state, why is the next state any more likely to get better information than one I got now? Am I just not moving around with a lot of uncertainty? But the thing is that when we reach the end of the game, then when I actually find out so the end position, we know if it's a one or lost position, the last one that is, and then, then if we this rule getting moved one step backwards, this is a position just one step away from a determined finished game. And the closer you are to those finished positions where you almost are uh, filled up the board and up by the win one of the last position, the better your information is going to be. So we can learn the rules. This information is moving backwards in time towards the start positions.
uh, and in a simple problem I mentioned first, that that's the part of that take a huge amount of studies on this simple problem since since 1950s when uh, Robbins was introducing this for the n r problem. The problem is that you here have no state, or you can say you have only one state, but you have a number of actions. You don't know the reward of each possible action. There's some distribution of the reward for that action, and you have to try them out to find out. So here is a previous possible version of exploration versus exploitation, which is why my study this. One might have pulled a few arms so far, might have pulled one arm once, another arm three times, another two times, and he has an average, average reward so far. And you could, of course, pull the one that has had the highest average reward so far, that would be the greedy move. But again, one need to explore to some extent to find out if some of the other actions are better than they looked so far. But you don't want to just uniformly explore either, because that would cost you a lot of unnecessary rewards. If something has looked a lot worse than the best arms so far, then we would, should more rarely uh, investigate those arms again than something that's quite close to the best arms we've seen so far. So the first motivation study is end on bandit problems in the 50s, or even before that, if you go back to 30 some of the medical trials, you have some treatment you try on people in a certain condition, and you can continue to just use that best treatment forever, but we never learn anything new. Medicine would have stopped in your tracks unless you learn when someone makes mistakes, which is someone. Sometimes how things have been done. But more systematically, they learn about this. But you cannot just randomly try all kinds of treatments. It, that would be horrible to the patients. So you need someone to maximize how much you've done while doing as little damage as possible to patients. So things have been not so promising. You don't want to do that to patients. You're almost, you're almost sure it's a really bad idea. You're almost sure it's going to die. You might not want to do that to the patient. Well, if something some, you have not seen that much of it, it seems reasonably promising, you, you might you think to convince patients of accepting that treatment that looks based on data you have that it might be better or slightly worse than what you know so far. But that is acceptable. So I'm due to the patient who's going to a lot, and then people will profit from this forever after this. So this is a very serious problem that needs to be studied in a serious and formal manner, and that is formalized in and not bad problems. And there's a lot of theory, and I'm going to tell you about that, and you should study it with regret. When you look at it in retrospect, or would it, what is the best action? If I know the best action, if I take that the whole time, and then I compare the actual action sequence to that, and I can prove various plans on how much this regret is growing over time, and some algorithm, you can have its own logarithmic growing. Under, under some but I'm not going to talk so much about theorems today, but more as a conceptual and applied nature of these things. So, one way of formulating this, if you're going to have a thousand states of this bandit, how do you maximize the total reward? So then early on, you need to do quite a lot of exploratory moves, while as you approach the end, you will instead then start to just exploit what you've done so far. So a very simple example here, where we have to look at, we have to look at for example, epsilon uh, exploration. Uh, so we can initialize some table to zero, table of these values, maybe it's average reward to zero, and then at the time you do something average, you can get a gray line, it's going on up to the point where you will eventually do the best thing, or you eventually do it 90% of the time. Eventually the table will be correct, but well, actually 90% you will 10% probably do some random action, and, and then you might have to have those 10 units wrong. Six. So then it will 91% of the time equal. So you should automatically would have an epsilon that decreases over time. Early on you do, do a lot, later on a bit later. Here we look that with, with a 10% uniform way across time. If you have a task where you have 10 arms, and we randomize the normal distribution, so normal distribution for, for the rewards. A very different method is to use an optimistic method. Let's say instead of putting the initial value estimate of zero, let's say you start with five and you treat that as if you have some original observation of five, and you know in this case for this setup that five is more than you can expect. In that case, you will automatically get some very systematic exploration early on in this problem because all the arms look very good and that when you get rewards. All rewards will disappoint, and some will disappoint more than others, and those value estimates will go down 
faster than the value as methods who are less disappointing, and therefore you end up doing the less disappointing things more often. While the first round, you basically just end up cycling through the whole thing because the thing you have updated more times, you have decreased more because it being so disappointing. But then after a while, you begin to automatically get less and less exploration over time, and the things that have been very disappointed early on end up getting worse than where the other ones could have go, and that would be automatically abandoned. The optimist is one of the broader use techniques. A lot of the methods where you have good theoretical guarantees for are optimistic, and a lot of the methods that perform the best in practical experiments also these optimistic methods. There are a few other ones, more sophisticated ones, that also perform very well. Some popular recent time called Thompson sampling, a Bayesian method, you have a prior thing, then you sample the method, you sample the model over it, and then you have to relive on that model, but then you sample a new model, and through that you sample the, the appropriate amount of exploration, you also manage to get this logarithmic regret over time, instead of higher one. That's all the goal when you expand it, you want to be able to get that one to have logarithmic regret over time. So one of the big applications I have today is no longer medical treatments, though that's still also interesting, but ad placements on the internet too. These internet giants that do search and need to place advertisement, and not to search other things as well, they need to decide if they're going to place uh, the ad that has done the best in the current, in the context they're in the best, or if you want to try one of the new ones. You might have a new ad that you've not tried that many times before. It might work very well in that context. Enough. So they need to do the concept of context, context of branding. And then within that context, you have this exploration expectation. Therefore, it became a lot of work out of some Yahoo research some years back. We, not so much now, I can say a bit moving on, but, but therefore, I saw a lot of these banded research exploding out of things like Yahoo research. Exactly. All right, so the Aon Bandit is by itself not that rather than for more general intelligence, it says no concept state, you're always in the same state, or you can have this context for then you don't affect the next state you're in. So that is quite different from the with AI problems, though they have a lot of applications, and the result, the lesson one learned from it is still important, as we will see also in more general context. <coughs> Go ahead, for example, in a search tree, how to choose between trying out new options and continuing with the ones that look the best so far. So the results on bandits are being quite important to other more general things. Okay, so this is the agent mark interface, or rather the Markov decision process version of it, where you have environment an agent, if the agent is state and a reward, and that the agent takes actions. So you see down here the cycles that seems to develop according to. Okay, it's difficult to hear the back. Focus on monetary rewards. 
So we usually use the notation v pi of s to denote the sum for the value function. And pi is policy function from states to actions. And so that is the expected discount reward sum, which is one called the return, given that you are in state s. And we can rewrite this as the first reward plus gamma times the false afterwards from the so called Bellman equation, which we're going to use quite a lot. So that gives us a possibility to do these bootstrapping methods I mentioned. So one simple example of value function is play golf. So state, so the ball location is a state, and you will get to the ball. And let's say we get minus one for each stroke, we count the amount of number of strokes, you prefer fewer, and if you want to have value of state, uh, given that you're going to put the whole way, you get this kind of value functions where the further away you are, the more negative reward is. It's going to take several steps until you get there. So this is for an undiscounted, undiscounted reward. We also want to be interested in a way interested in the optimal value function, that is, you insert a state, you take an action, and then you assume you're going to do the best possible things after that. Instead of just continuing putting, it instead going to do the best thing at each time, then we get a different value function, we usually know what to choose star. So here we want to know how good it is to use the driver in that state, and then you assume that if you get to the wing, you're going to start putting instead. So if one has estimated choose star, then the good thing is that then we can always just act greedily. If we have a correct estimate of that, it tells us what the best action is, so it does represent the policy. Uh, so there are a few different methods of trying to estimate the value function. If you estimate it actually, you're almost done with your problem. So one thing is what's called a simple Monte Carlo return. So in this case, you actually play a whole episode, like the whole game of tic-tac-toe. You, you see what rewards you accumulate after certain state S. For the board position, you see what return did you achieve after that. And then you move your estimate just in that direction of the return you actually achieved after that. And then we keep playing like that, and the return estimates are going to converge towards the correct one if it has a finite state space. And we explore the sufficiency of time. So in that case, with Mount Carlo return, you have to do a whole episode before you do anything, which can be a very bad thing if you, for example, don't have an episodic task, for example, then you never reach some end of it, or if you have very long ones, and you don't learn anything whilst this is going on. So for more general AI tasks, you do want something that does not rely on ending, needing the end of an episode to occur. So the different methods are based on this, on bootstrapping. They're a bit like what I showed on tic-tac-toe example. So you make a move, an action, end up in the next state, st plus one, and you receive some reward rt plus one. And then you do an update based on what I mentioned, that the Bellman equation, that value of st should be equal to the reward plus gamma times the next state, but if it's not, we have an error, and we do an update based on that, so that we can decrease that error over time. So that's called temporal difference learning, and then you can learn truly online while you're performing this. And some people have connected this to some updates that are going on based on dopamine in, in neuroscience as well. So I think there's still some debate on if that's actually going on or not, but quite a lot of people are studying such models of, 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 neuro, uh, of neurons. Another method that you can only use if you know a model, that's either you know a true model or you have already estimated a model, that you have in stage with everything, you can estimate your transition probabilities, for example, based on frequency estimates, based on how things are going on, you see your sequence state, action board, next state, and so on, and you can count how from one state to another state, you estimate a model based on that, and then you want to calculate your optimal policy, and in that case, when you have a model, you can use dynamic programming instead to perform that. So that would be a model-based method or a planning method. So in planning, you assume that you receive the correct model, while you can also use the model-based reinforcement learning. So if you compare these different methods, so bootstrapping as in temporal difference learning, so that involves updating an estimate. So some of these do sampling, 
English, both TV and one quarter does. Well, TV does it online, one quarter the whole episodes. Well, DP relies on having a model already. Well, DP really just goes through the whole sequence of everything, but does not have to draw samples. So, TV is a method that goes to bootstrapping and selfing, which makes it quite attractive for more demanding problems. So some advantages, yes, it does not require a model of the environment, you need to not, do not need to have done that already. Uh, and it can be fully incremental, which one call is not. So you can learn before knowing the final outcome, and there's something that some sort of rewards along the way. It uses less memory than a model-based method, where you have to represent the whole model. It's computationally quite cheap, and you can learn from incomplete sequences. It, most of these both my power and TD can be proven to converge under some uh, assumption. Uh, for example, if we have finite state space and we continue to see all states at this uh, infinitely, if we see it infinitely often over, over the infinite sequence, that is, there's no limit to how, how many times we will eventually see every state action pair. One can then prove that TD learning converges. So, I'm going to really talk a little bit about these various <laughs> examples that I talked about in the beginning, I listed a number of successes of reinforcement learning, so I want to sh show you a little bit more about how they were, were handled and, and how challenging those problems can be as being. So, uh, Matt Gannon was solved quite long ago, but saw in the early 90s, the uh, best player in the world. It's really quite an enormous problem if you ask them to try to search through it. You know, Second branch in fact goes on 400. And it is going to take a lot of moves before you reach this, some end position. But I managed to solve this by combining self conditions learning with a neural network as a value function approximator. So you, on these RTD updates, instead of updating each entry in some table, you instead update parameters for value function approximator. So in this case, in this case, a neural network. You also need to do something not talk about is an eligibility trace which allows you to update past states as well as the current ones. So the information goes a little bit further back, back in time. So that is by any count a very challenging problem, but it suited temporal difference learning very well. So it showed early on that that temporal difference that methods can solve quite, quite challenging problems. But much earlier than that was Samuel's second player. It's also quite a difficult problem, particularly when we have computers from the 50s. So he estimates on storing polynomials, so you, get, you have a parameterized value function estimator. He tried to estimate that polynomial, so it tells him in each score, in each board position of shifters, what is the value of that board position. Uh, so again, you get some generalization to get the neural networks different by the value, entry by value, entry by the learning parameters in, instead of the cells, you're generalizing across similar board positions. So the kind of thing he was doing, he did combine this with a sort of alpha data search. So he doesn't just update one step, but he looks at number, he searches a number of steps into the future until he finds the leaves of the path he wants to take and it forms an update based on the number of steps instead, which can often improve the performance of a TD agent as you learn some value estimates, but instead of greedily going to the next board position that looks the best, you can calculate with something like an alpha beta so the number of steps in the future. If you think of chess, for example, even if your estimated board position is not that accurate, it's not that insightful, but if you count some 10 moves into it, it might be a very clear distinction. You might have lost your queen and and some knight and a rook or something, and suddenly it's quite easy to see that you're in a losing position. A large amount of sequence and movement give you very easy to estimate board position. Well, the current one might be more subtle. Or you might see that you, in some sequences, have won a large amount of material, or you've checkmated the opponent, and you get to much more easily distinguish your positions, where you can distinguish very good from very bad. So, it's often a good idea to combine these, these value estimates with such a few big steps forward, which has also been done in, in computer code or in chess. Another problem studied in the 90s 
the elevators usually started as a planning problem. So the planning problem would require either that you have some that you have some sort of model of where people are arriving or that you do it in, in a more minimax setting of some sort. But if you're going to do it I mean, based on that based on that you don't know about how people are moving in the building, then it can be, then using reinforcement learning can be a very good idea. Um, this is also a very challenging problem. But if you're there some success is off peak, well when there are tons of people arriving all the time, some of the things from the planning community have performed better. But in the off peak where it was more useful to learn to learn more things about where people are going to arrive. It, their enforcement learning hasn't performed quite well. And also, this is an enormous problem in many ways. They have a num number of elevators, they have quite a few different floors, people arriving at different places. They estimated that a, in such a building as one sort of picture, they would have 10 to the 22 states. So, again, it's a very large scale problem in many ways, uh, arriving from that uh, quite modest scene in the past. So, you have to decide when you're between every floor, free elevator, when you're between floor, you have to decide will it stop at the next floor or will it just keep going? And when you stop the floor, you have to decide if you're going to go up or down or stay where it is. So one interesting thing that often use is elevator tasks for saying is about the difficulty of finding the reward structure and how odd things can get if you find a wrong reward structure and you blindly optimize that reward structure, which is what we talked about. So this is what sometimes discussed also by people discussing uh, AI safety of how some things can be can go very wrong from uh, optimizing something that seems quite innocuous. You could in principle start doing some quite horrible things. So in, in this case, for example, if we use average wait time as something we want to minimize, well in that case it just doesn't really care about dropping people off anymore. So that's an obviously bad idea. So, well, so if I'm not that stupid, one includes the travel time as well. One have to go pick them up quite fast and drop them off quite fast, so that's quite nice. But since it's an average, it might ignore some people quite, uh, quite indefinitely ignore them, uh, because it might be better to leave them and accumulate wait time for that person when they can pick up a lot of other people and get that work done. If there are people far off, a lot of floors away. That, that might be highly suboptimal to have a care about that person. But, well, though it's better than not caring about dropping someone off once you pick them up, some, well, it's a stress. Another obviously dumb thing is percentage that are waiting for more than 60 seconds. If you wait 61 seconds, forget about it. It would be a great point just picking someone up if they're already in that. Well, you're not completely hopeless, but you're quite likely to get stuck if there are more, more people to pick up. So a lot better thing is, for example, use average square of that wait time or the system wait time. In that case, if you have ignored someone for some point of time, the punishment just keeps growing. For either having let them wait somewhere or let them stand around the elevator being carried around the building. So I don't immediately see how it would do a terrible thing due to average square wait time, but I guess one can invent scenarios also where where a truly optimal elevator would do horrible things to the people in the building. Anyway, uh, an exciting progress that's been just in the last few years, well, last 10 years, perhaps, right, has been in Computer Go. You might always used to hear this as one of these examples of people saying AI is not happening. You say, look how stupid it is as Computer Go. AI cannot solve Computer Go. And it still doesn't beat the best player in the world. But at that time, uh, a lot of people were beating, a lot of quite average people who just uh, but some average club player was beating the best computer go player in the world. So that looked like it was completely stupid. And a lot of people use that as a big task to solve for AI. But that happened quite suddenly with a huge improvement. That happened uh, uh, around 2006. So it doesn't first to say a few things what does not apply. You cannot just immediately start using dynamic programming or Temporal difference learning because state space is just too large, it's even worse than before. And even though they tried to craft very smart features, but it was not quite sufficient to get very good players at all. It 
it, it just start hopeless task to learn a global value function for compute to go. And that's not that's still the case. One still does not manage to learn a global value function that tells you something good about wherever you are in in this state space. Those plays are still the complete amateurs. So the new approach was that you take the situation that you're in, the actual board position you have, and then you treat that as if it were a new game. So you can start playing there. So one way to so more recent is you can use temporal difference learning, because that's not what's right here. But you start playing, you do self-play from that position on. And you keep doing that and learn a value function approximator from the state you're in. So you ignore most of the possible positions. And you but what you do manage to learn is to manage to learn a value function for the next that's reasonable for the next few moves, and you play it double until the end of the game. And then you manage to get a lot better estimates. You can of course start from a global value function, but it doesn't make that big of a difference because they are incredibly bad. So they, so this difference from doing it from the board position you actually in makes it jump by like a thousand rating points. So from a very bad player, it just makes it monumental jump to a really, really good master player. So the first way of doing it was using upper confidence bounds apply to trees methods. So that's actually like plugging this bandit problem into each situation as you search for from board position you start searching and you for the first few positions you want to apply this bandit to decide if as we've been searching before you see some trajectories and you try and decide are you going to use the the move you see in terms of best before and best fit before or you're going to try some of the other ones a bit more. Yes. So what are the papers uh, that this oh, that was the courses and Chester Schwarz in 2006, and then it was really applied to computer Go by Silver and uh, I think we'll forget his name, yeah. Yeah, Gally and Silver the next year. So they, they took these to manage to extend these logarithmic bounds from. These bandit, these up, well, that is due to peak hour, the upper confidence bounce applied to bandits. When it got logarithmic progression on that in 2002, it's a basic bandit. Well, then in 2006, they extended this to the tree setting where you have this bandit problem. In each point in your search tree, you perform this. You use a concentration inequalities to decide how confident you are in your estimates, and you based on that manage to decide. Which, uh, which of the actions going to try out next. And then you do a play out. So you do some random play out after a certain horizon to, to the end of the board. Which in Go is a reasonably good thing. Well, in chess it's not such, such a reasonable, but, but in, in Go it seems like if you stop some position, then you at the end do the random play out. It still gives you some reasonable amount of estimation of the territory that you'll get at the end. But you can also, another later method, 2010, called TD search, which also gets very good results, which actually use just TD learning, that's much more general. This apply, this thing that still has the best results rely on a few particular properties of Go. Some of the order doesn't always matter that much in various ways. But these other TD search methods are much more general, it contains nothing really specific about Go. And you get almost as good results with that. So you also get this thousand point rating move from the from the early results. Where you have to play temporal difference temporal difference learning from the new game that starts in the board position you have and you play repeatedly in that one. So that is from Sutton's group in Alberta, Silver and Sutton. Yes. So it's just an obvious how you can do that, because if you just treat your current state as if it was a new game. Uh, then surely you're going to be seeing possible actions that actually you can't take because it's not the start of a new game. Well, well it, I mean, you've got to decide what your next action is. That's, that's the whole thing you're going to, that you're going to do with this method. Yeah. You have to take into account the current state? Yes, yeah, the current, yeah, yes, okay, sorry, you misunderstand what I mean. I, I mean, as if you had a game uh, go, but it starts with that position as a start position. The, your current state as a start position. As you treat that as that was a game of go. That's what I meant. Yeah, yeah, you don't start from initial position, that would be useless. But yes, go. So the 
is it like it sounds like it's kind of underfitting problem that you can't really put in the single model all of the possible starting states, so you specialize your model to some starting state. Yeah. But in principle, you know, why wouldn't that work uh, for the general case? Like, you just you just need more memory or more play, right? Well, when it comes to about computation in, in this, but 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 you, you do manage to get something for the first few moves in in this. So if you learn from the whole thing, then you start from the start position, and then you do learn a value function. But for the first few moves in Go are okay, but then further in, you have rarely seen anything that's close to the game because there's so many different games that you've never been close to it, and you can keep going. You can keep going for the millennium, great on Google's cloud. Well, the past some state, I'm not sure if you can keep going for millennium. Google's full cluster, but but. but you, you would almost never ever get close to, to the kind of positions. There's still probably many positions. So, so that's the problem. If you, if you just learn from the start position for games, you only do good estimates for the first few moves. But, but the good idea is then to move this so you redo this whole thing. So it takes a lot of computation, but you redo it again. So, so you redo this again for each position. But that is still feasible to be doing because you learn reasonably fast about the first few and then quickly the whole thing goes completely perfect. But you only need to use it to take the first move and then someone the other person do another move and then you get going again and you have to you have to do this whole thing. So how did you do this inverted helicopter flight? It has some differences to the plane go. That when you, well, if you would sort of play out until the helicopter is smashed, that would not be a very good idea. So you have to do things a, a bit differently when you actually have embodied tasks. So what what they're doing here is that here they have to use a more model-based approach in reinforcement learning. That is, they have some humans flying the helicopter. They collect the data, then they estimate dynamics from all the data that they're having, and then they take that as a simulator in computer and then they perform this planning task uh, in, in simulation. And then they put that on a, a helicopter and the nice thing was that it was immediately actually working out, which was a fun thing. And they uh, both this very difficult task of hovering upside down. Very few humans are good enough to be able to hover one of these helicopter upside down in, in instability. So they needed a really human expert to take it up there and then do this task and showing how it's actually done while also flying around. To, to, well, in other ways to learn just about the, the dynamics of the world of flying a helicopter, these different controls and what effects they have on the world. And they managed to learn a sufficiently good model so that when, then they, when they learn a good policy in simulation, it actually works it, and how it upside down. I mean, you, see, you can see the videos on this on YouTube. They put up both that one and they have a lot of other crazy acrobatics that, that the helicopter is doing. But it was another big success. Uh, of the last about 10 years ago. All right, so on to, to the most recent stuff from those early successes, what is now being discussed. For example, at Triple I, we have this workshop on sequential decision making. And some talks there, I did one related to this arcade learning environment. You might also see, if you saw Eric Page being interviewed by Charlie Rose, you see him showing. The thing from DeepMind, which they paid a reasonable amount of money, yeah. that's an unreasonable amount of money for, and seeing how, how their, uh, their reinforcement learning method based on cognitive nets is managing to play superhumanly in some Atari games. It plays some model, and it doesn't play all of them. They have some first test 2050 core games, and there's another 450, but I think they play a bit more than half of them really, really well, but some of them have other more tricky challenges that I still have to still have to work on. So this might look like a silly game compared to flying that helicopter. So I talked about being managed to play computer go as a as a real human champion or flying helicopter that very few people can do. So and I'll bring up Pong. So of course it looks like a step taking a step back to well look simpler than checkers even that sounds sold in the fifties. 
But the thing is, we want to solve all of our games and we want to have a feature map that is just generic, that is not engineered, so not telling you exactly. Well, what you're going to care about is that there's ball in one position, I have a pad in my position, and then learning to put the pad where the ball is coming, that would not be that hard, it would be quite a simple task to solve long ago. But instead, what one is going to do to solve this challenge, we we'll take some generic features. So, for example, you split up the screen in tiles, and for each tile, look at what colors are present in that tile, and then you can, for example, take pairwise of all those features. And then you might do a linear function approximately that's like an inner product with a parameter vector. So that's not going to be enough all games to represent even a sufficiently good value function to be able to solve those problems. In Pong, this should be enough because there's really two things discovering that all color is one position, my own pad is in another position. So those pairwise features we should do with Pong, but it's still not that they're simple to solve it anyway. So, so you, you want to have this and so this is a great challenge for people who care about API and keep people who care about general reinforcement learning because there's a wide variety of these Atari games and the different human cognitive abilities at play to figure out how to solve these different games. I think even there is some chess game among those. So, well, learn to play chess from pixel matrix, that's going to be pretty hard. So that's not the first thing on the list for people doing. But there's a wide variety of these kind of things like Pong and the various things like Space Invaders with shooting things, other games with going with airplane and avoiding things and shooting other things, and things where you run around on platforms. But there's quite a large variety of it, so it's really, really challenging to solve this. And I think you need to figure out something quite essential about AI to be able to really solve all these fair 500 Atari games. You need to get quite a bit on the way towards the other intelligence to really solve, solve this. It's a great thing that a lot of people are now starting to care about this and that this has been that this has been released in the last few years and more and more top labs are beginning to care about addressing this, this problem. So we'll say that so the first paper studied linear function approximations. Some people have get improved results by having much more expressive uh, value functions, some kind of convolution neural nest attempt. Seem to have been a good idea, seem to be invariant, invariances of the screen seem to have been very useful for them, but there's two other approaches as well. But I'm going to first talk a little bit about something that we have recently looked at in this, and that is here is my run. The UCT method is also good for computer Go. It also is really great for most Atari games. There's some games that it doesn't solve so well because it's also very tricky about the horizon and the dramatic things that happen so that you're difficult to get in the right thing or playing out in not a amount of simulations. But in other games, for example, like Pong, it plays perfectly with 21 to 0 against the computer, and a lot of other things, it plays far better than when humans are playing. So that is relying on having the simulator and performing this simulation search within that simulator. And then what well, can play very good with that one call of free search method for UCT. Some of the first learning results were reported in the first paper when they applied the classical temporal difference method. Yes? So has UCT been compared to the DeepMind uh, player? Uh, well, yes, they don't beat UCT, but it's unfair as well because they solve the learning problem. They're not given the simulator. So, so here I show the difference in how well we manage to solve the planning problem when we're given the simulator and you get to search in it, and the good thing is that you can reset things, you don't have to play whole trajectories, but you can be in your state, you can search, and, and reset back to that state which you were in, and keep doing that simulation. Well, if you, you can in principle, of course, just play to the end and then play out the actions from the start again, and end up in the same position, so it's deterministic. So you can get around with the learning problem, but it takes a large amount of time, so it becomes sad something feasible. And particularly if you have, you can also randomize stop positions in this a little bit. So they've done that by randomizing the first few actions. But randomize the first 10 actions that happens, and then you have to start playing. So then you said, 
then that is no longer working out, because then you cannot reset your position. So it is a big favor to get to be able to reset the position and be able to search in the simulator compared to having to perform whole trajectories, which is what the learning methods have to do. So the first learning method we use, for example, T learning on a linear value function approximator on those one or six million features, or not at all performing as well as those games or as well as human flesh matter either. A problem which should in principle be possible to solve with those pairwise fun uh, function approximators is still failing to do that. Playing some 5,000 episodes and still yes. Yeah. So instead of uh, assuming you have a simulator, yeah. could you learn a simulator and then use it in the UCT like framework? Well, that is something that has been attempted. So there's another group in DeepMind, the given subgroup, which is the people that well, my boss, uh, that Marcus that I worked with, has supervised his PhD student earlier, but Joel Vaness. So they, they first started with learning a model. So whether they use a quad tree, so they looking at all the possible quad trees when they're splitting up the screens in pieces, where then you have to look at each piece, what colors are there, and then they try to predict the next frame. And so they managed to predict that reasonably well based on that method, based on the context tree weighting method, it's called. Uh, I want to mention a little bit about that kind of methods uh, later on. So, so they get a reasonably predictive reform model, but applying UCT in it does not work so well anyway. Because these, and that's just highlighted in another recent paper at UI that was presented here, that the problem is there is systematic biases in some of these models, and then when you're searching through, you get to something that doesn't look like something that would appear. And that can happen. That paper just in Tetris or a simple game, but it appeared all in that in that game. So that, that they have to give up on, but they have solved that problem and doing something else then. If they have reason to solve it, doing something else then. Mm -hmm. Then you use a T search, they use something called planning as inference, which is a different sort of method for forming the planning manager to do it a lot more efficiently. And now we can play perfect pong. It's such a one method where they learn a model, so they learn a cruder model than a full simulator, but it's sufficiently refined to be able to to play perfectly and play really well in some of the games. So that is now comparable to the other deep learning based method in, in performance. And it's only about half of those first 50 games really, really well. They haven't published that yet. So we will see in a few months, I think, when that is that's going to be out. But that was a bit hard enough now to manage to do that as well. And that is big, they had a big gain on the other thing that is in sample complexity. That is, how many interactions do you need? before you learn really well. Because the model can then capture a lot of what you learned so far with all the information, relevant information is really encapsulated within the model. And then you have to perform the search within the model without playing more in the game. You can be a lot more sample efficient. So they learn to win in Pong after some 36 episodes or something, which is a lot better in that case. Well, the way one do the deep learning things is one getting a lot of data, but but they can do that faster, it takes longer time to play, of course. So, so they have so some efficient gain in that. So you could, of course, do the deep learning method within the learned models, so that perhaps is some other step if we follow them to try out. So anyway, I'm going to show you something else that we did that I think have some relevance also to what I'm going to talk about here towards, towards some more general settings. And so we try to see why, why does it not manage to do learn as well as it should be able to learn based on these linear fun value function approximate. Instead of get, getting a better approximate to see if there is some other way one can somewhat transfer some of that, that, that inside and use a key over to the linear value function approximator. So we introduce a setting which I think can be important for learning with general intelligence that is having more information than just this reward signal. The reward signal can be quite poor in reality. So you're playing a game at the end of a long game, you find out if you won or lost. It's a very small amount of feedback you're getting in total. And the exploration problems are very difficult. The sample complexity for reinforcement learning is in general much worse than it is for, for example, for supervised learning, which makes some people think it's not such a feasible approach because of the poverty of the stimulus that reward signal. But here we're looking at something where we manage to feed a little bit more of information to help the reinforcement learning agent get started. And there are many people that have been doing this 
It is very strange that you're very related to each other. It's done by demonstration, probably in robotics. You demonstrate to Robert how to swing a racket and hit a ball in tennis, and suddenly you manage to get the robot to learn it. If it has to do it completely on its own, it's a very difficult task, freely, of trying all kinds of different swings, standing there on tennis court and balls coming. Uh, you will be waiting for years until it ever hits the ball, so that is, of course, a disastrous approach in many ways. But it doesn't mean that reinforcement learning is planned as an approach, because we can try to teach it, just that we as people need to be taught things, and I think we are reinforcement learning agents to, to a large extent. And so giving advice to the agent in various ways, so demonstration, showing it something to imitate, or giving it some information. So here we put in this most recent work, we're doing something where we have an oracle. So we have some state, for example, and we're sending this oracle. And the oracle tells us its value estimate is for the optimal value function in that particular state that you pass through. Of course, if you can get it while you play, you just can play the highest value action, you can play perfectly. But the thing is that you have some learning phase where you do learn from this, you play an episode, and then for the states you're in, you find out what the actual estimates of optimal values would have been in that state. So you get data in that form uh, of estimates of actual actions in certain states. And the way we, in this case, but in a target set, is we use UCT, which are calculating value estimates as part of its, of its simulation. And then we feed that to the agent, so we have these various feature vectors, and then an action, and use the estimates of value. We collect that in some data set, and then we just perform a regression on this. We, in this case, just use some finished package for liblinear to estimate the value, estimate the value from, from all this data. So it's just a regression problem now. So then we do this complexity of supervised learning, which is a lot lower than that of reinforcement learning, which is uh, the point here. And what we do is think of some called data set aggregation algorithm. One important point here in the thing we actually do is that we don't just watch UCT play and get its value estimates, but we have the agent playing an episode and then it gets along its own trajectory, it's getting the value estimates along its own states and then learning from those. And that makes a big difference because it's quite far from being able to play it back to UCT and it's end up in different states than UCT is doing anyway. So it gets, so if you try to learn UCT, it quickly gets off the path of where UCT has been and then it doesn't know that much after that. So it, instead of using UCT as an oracle where you feed information of places where the agent has previously been and give the agent a chance to repair its past mistakes. In making things wrong, it finds out from this teacher, from this oracle, what would have been a better way of understanding the world in those states it was actually in. And that makes quite a big difference. So, here yeah, first the plots, but I have some videos to show. So, it shows that with this advice algorithm, with this advice interest, in just a few episodes, we learn to win quite a lot of points. So in Pong, and that's just how we started in the first few episodes, the red line is a TV learning method. It played for 5,000 episodes, 5,000 games, and it still got stuck on only winning on average two points per game, which is quite random, quite random uh, winning. Uh, well, if you're trying to learn from user T instead, you also do not got, do much better than, than the red line. So somewhat included on the plot for that part. Let's go at this point show you. Q-star is coming from? Oh, you, oh, sorry, it is learning algorithm. Right, so, so have you, when you use the key, is trying to find the estimates for optimal policy after where it is. Yeah, right, yeah. 
while playing this out. So you get an estimate of Q star. I got not an actual Q star, but U T is trying to estimate it for each of the action, actions and get a better get a better estimate for the best actions, while it has a low estimate for the worst action. So we take this as estimate of Q star and then we try to perform the regression. Do you use QCT or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, start a yeah, so first I play an episode with the agent, and it plays quite badly. And then we go through the state, we send each state to UCT to perform these simulations from that state. And then it finds value estimates. But that, and that uses the correct simulator? Yes. So, so the idea here is that in a training phase, I can give it a lot more information, but then it's capable of acting completely on its own after a training phase with this explicit policy. So how would a real robot do that? It doesn't have a simulator. Well, uh, my thought is for... Well, well in, in robotics, you, you could have a lot of different robot, robots and they act in various sort of places and the game experiences and they might then, in their various narrow settings, uh, be learning an optimal, uh, an estimate of optimal function. Estimates. So, so some robot is the, if you have a lot of robots, so there will be pretty bots if you see in the Alberta peak. Well, here's one example of robots. So if you have a lot of them around in the world, same, same robot, for example, a house cleaning robot, uh, and then um, it's in a very limited context and it can perform some sort of machine learning to, to learn estimates of option value function, then upload it to the cloud to the, this hype where and then you can perform the regression at night and send it out to all the house cleaning bots in the world and learn from each other. That's, that's some of view of how one, one would be able to perform something like this in an interesting way to create. I mean, you, you could also use a simulator inside the, the AI mind architecture of, of your robot, of course. I mean, that, that, that's what we're doing with some of our OpenCog robotics work. I mean, you have, you have Gazebo, which is a robot simulator. The vision system observes the world then you port that into the map in Gazebo, and then you can simulate simulate things there many times before trying them out in, in, in the physical world. I mean, it's of limited value, but still very significant value, right? Because, I mean, Gazebo isn't perfect, but it lets you rule out really, really dumb things that you wouldn't want to try in the real world, so it, it dramatically reduces the number of trials that, that you need to do. For for those cases where Gazebo was a different si decent simulator, which is basically anywhere that basic Newtonian mechanics is, is, is what you're dealing with. I mean, it, it doesn't work for for swimming or flying or wading through peanut butter or something at, at the moment. All right. So, so I showed the first video with UCT plays perfectly. This other video is going to be quite bad. Thing. This is where you only watch UCT play according to these states and get a value of some of those. And then you try to learn from that. And what you see is that the first two conflicts are similar, but then it's going to get off, it's going to get into spaces where it hasn't seen, because UCT does not end up in these kind of situations, and it's ended up quite bad. And here is someone never managed to get to something it understands again, so it's going to be quite bad. It's just going to get to those first two points at one, and then it is completely lost because it will never be in the sort of kind of is a sort of feature vector that UCT was ending up with again. So it's showing that just running UCT for some survey episodes and taking that study estimates is a bad thing. But what is a much better way to it affects it on? Well, okay, so this one got a survey one at some point, but then I think it loses the uh, Well, then the third thing is the thing where we instead letting the agent play an episode and it then afterwards gets all the estimates from UCT for the situations it was actually in and then it's learning quite a lot better. Well, it doesn't look like it, but when it gets going, it's going to win a lot more points than, than the other one did. And then it can be continued. So in this game, it wins some points, but that situation where it loses points by doing the wrong thing, missing the ball. But then, after the episode, we use UCT as an oracle, and we find out what were the correct or better value estimates have been in those positions it was actually in, and then it's doing repair in those situations. So they got that smart to, to actually play, it fails and stuff, get the information and repair it. Yes? Uh, 
It just looks like the, the it's done a policy which is not to get the bat in the right place at the right time, but to get the bat somewhere near the right place and then oscillate furiously around that point. Do you think that's reasonable? It, well, yeah, then I, it, it somehow doesn't have the get a function in it. Yeah, it's, it's more clear when it's somehow uh, further away that it should go in that position, but then the fine-tuning of the, of the thing where it's not in that position. That might need a lot more data to, really, to get to that point. But then it, it's an up this stupid situation here up in the corner, where he's not been, he's not seen enough data on that before, and so then he loses the rest of the points. But the next time around he gets some more information about those points, and if that was not enough, then he's end up in the same position again, and then get even more data on that kind of situation, and then he learns from those. Yes. I mean, this is, I don't know how relevant the question is, but the, when you're, if you're trying to compare results between different researchers, yep. I mean, I'm assuming that when you're doing these types of things with these arcade games, that you have to play against a human being to, to see how well your results are accepted. Well, the people have played all these games to try to calibrate uh, how well it is. When you manage. But, you, but you are competing against another human being, right? Like, that well, depends on the game. Yeah. I mean, it, sure. in Pong, there's another player. In some of these games, there's not. Right. But I guess, so, I guess it depends on the skill of the human player and if they're trying hard or not. Yeah. So, yeah, you, you must have some of defeat. If he was a was a built-in thing, but we've been playing against the Atari game and not against another you know, human. They were calibrating against. Right. So, but I guess it makes it a little bit more difficult to compare results to the researchers that aren't so good at fighting. Yeah, well, some are fanatic. Yeah, becomes pong players instead <laughs> instead of PhD students. It's very unfortunate thing. <laughs> So instead of observing the full state of the world, which is of course in reality impossible to do, you just get some observations, and uh, some very local observations of the big world, like that mouse up there, seeing just this little corner. And to, to be able to handle this, you need to remember a history of observations. Uh, and that's something we started for that five years in that five well, people started not longer. We started one approach in the last five years in our lab to learning. A history based methods so that does map from history to the final state space. That is a huge complex task, and then you try to learn a representation that is useful for you. So, even more general, even for us, even more general settings than partial observable model position process, we're not even assumed that the final state space is underlying it. So, this is a setting that we have looked at to how do we make all these partial position process work and those successes into something much more general. Uh, are they giving us some way towards more general intelligence, or are they just a narrow, uh, nowhere, so the dead end, is it just dead end street or not? Some things may be easier dead end if you want to go more to more general intelligence, we don't believe, so we believe in learning representations, and we love to talk uh, about that, for example, that is our workshop at AI, a lot of people are interested in learning representations more complex domains, so one then can apply the kind of MDP method that we are using. And that, for example, of deep minding their successes and Atari games, and it was one of other things that's been based on as well. In complex world, you process somehow into the small little nice thing. So you want to learn a map from history to states, and you want to do this in some sound manner so you can deal with complex uh, um, classes of maps. So the first, first attempt of doing this 
that uh, we had was just like looking at how do one learn a map so that we can uh, predict the future reward sequence. So that is something that allows to act well. So we're looking at the resulting MVP states and see can we, given those states, predict the current reward and can we predict the next state sequence. And looking at the ability to predict that to get to the penalty for complexity. So you want simpler maps, while if you get better ability to predict, if you get a chance of better ability to predict, we accept the more complex state space. But if it does not give us that much better ability to predict, we instead want a simpler map so we can learn faster in that. So that is what the model-based version of, of this framework was then cost and then we need to search this whole space of or, or optimized parameters and have parameters class of maps from history to states. We have mostly looked at discrete cases so far, though it's very interesting to look at continuous parameters cases, like the things that are going on in, in deep learning for representation learning, to get that to work out for reinforce, reinforcement learning. But what it looks like so far is that we cannot completely just decompose this, not lot decompose, but not completely. If you just learn it in an unsupervised manner across the world, it might not learn the right distinction for reinforcement learning. If you want an agent to perform well, there's certain distinctions that would matter for it to be able to take the important distinction in some part of state space where it's very important to look at very narrow or small differences to do the right thing. In other places, you don't have to understand that much about that part of the world because it's quite easy to act well in that part of it. So if you do it in an unsupervised manner, completely distinct from reinforcement learning, it's not working out that well, but it otherwise largely, it otherwise a lot of different tasks, yes. So is that true even if you consider the rewards to be observations that your state should be predicting? Well, oops. So that is what we have hoped is not, that is not the case. So, that is, so in this case, we're trying to both learn on the state sequence and the reward sequence. So if you can actually learn to predict the reward sequence well, then you can act well. So that is, so that is true. If, if you take the reward signal into the data, you have a much better chance of doing that. And then we have some discussion on various ways of doing that. Yeah, but why not do that? It seems natural that you should have a state that includes the reward as one of its major observations. Yes, so, so it has that the different nature and you, you, you could consider that you want to learn representations where you can sort of a different kind of tasks when someone gives you the reward afterwards. So that would work. But, but we are taking exactly your position that we need to learn about the reward as well. So here, that's the major part and even in the second of the equations, we, we change the thing that we can pull the theoretical sum to a thing where we put even more weight on the reward sequence to make sure that one put a lot of the effort into managing modern rewards. But if you put all effort there, then we'll get a bad thing where it predicts the current reward well, but not the future reward well. So learning the dynamics of the world help, helps you get the longer term rewards, but you have to learn how to predict the current reward from current state. So, so, so but it's actually right, it, it is our philosophy. So, so here we're thinking about reward sequence, but it can be quite difficult. So here we took even more discriminative criteria. Instead of, instead of the reward sequence, predict the value function instead. So here we say that, we know that Q function should satisfy the Bellman equation that has unique solutions. So if it's identified so that we can be close to satisfying the, the Bellman equation here and plus some regular sets that penalize complexity, this is a simple is our simple task to do because you don't have a whole sequence of rewards that can be intricate, but you only be able to predict how good and bad each possible action in your current state is. So instead of baking into the board, you bake in, you, you would like to bake into value function. You don't have value function unless you, for example, listen to the framework I just talked about. Then if you just bake that in, you have a simple supervised learning test. If you don't have advice, good advice for that, the best you can do is I'm trying to do what is, what Q learning is based on, that is trying to satisfy this action element equation. Is just the current observation? No, no, that's the map. There's a map from these history observations to the states. So the states here are, okay, so here at fire HT. So a history HT and a map is to state space that depends on fire. Okay, so HT is the whole history that is not yeah. into a fixed size vector? Yes. Or to this thing, but that is not as realistic as just as, as mapping it to an actual feature vector, which is correct. So this brings it a lot closer to some of the other methods going on in more traditional looking 
things that feature selection fatigue methods where you, they look at MVPs, but if you look at the history, you can look at it as a bunch of features that occurred until that time. So we can actually map between work that some people that view themselves as MVPs are doing, so getting even more of the MVP work into this much more general setting, which is which is a good thing. They then have an edit one rate, I think, that lasts a version of TD. We use a more aggressive F0 uh, regularization term at times because we didn't use gradient methods to talk masses. So in that uh, so in this case, if you use the fixed policy you can actually as you can, as you do supervise, it actually can be used even further to feed set feed select of the supervised learning. You want to predict the return you see afterwards from the state. But we would need really need the policy to be able to change over time. Otherwise so, otherwise one will not find new places where where it's interesting to go. You need to gradually be able to learn increment need to increment the learning. And that is working with the first criteria up there. So, so in this criterion, there's nothing that encourages uh, phi to, to keep all of the past information, only what it means for the reward. Right? Yeah, for prediction value, it, it, the value of different actions, it trying to throw away everything else and what we need to predict the value of each action. So that is correct. So, so that, that is what we hope to do in today. You want also to have something that you can use as a simulator that you need another part of the cost function. Yeah, yes, you need a lot more, uh, much richer state space in that case. So, so we hope here to be able to get to some minimalistic to be able to do more larger tasks with one, one hope. So this is the overall structure of all of these sort of aliens I discussed in this part. You act with some cycles, you do some random action first, you have nothing else to do, you form this cost function based on the data, you use, for example, simulate annealing for get it map five if you if you have discrete set otherwise it might be some great procedure and then you are out, you estimate a good policy in that MDP that has been created by the feature map then you act for while I'm going to call it epoch you go to that you get new data we feed that into the cost function so the cost function is now more is more data so it's a richer cost function it represents more things we estimate a new feature map five which can have more distinctions in it and then we find a good policy in that MVP, and then after what all comes to that, we go into these cycles of these sort of different actions. So what I haven't mentioned is what kind of feature maps we use. We use quite simple ones so far. We look at the suffix trees that, depending on context, we remember a few observations in the past. So if you have mouse in the maze, if you're in some situation, remembering a few observations, something you can infer where, where you are. We also might have some longer term dependence by putting some loops in these trees, but then we went to function approximation, where we have an easy way of that, where we feature the are picking out some observation from your past and checking if it is, for example, a wall to the right four times steps ago or not. That's a feature. We consider that whole set of such features and we perform some simulated annealing procedure to find a good set of features which allows us to predict the a value function well. But this is still somewhat limited, it's not a bridge as for example this long short term memory version of the current net or something. But we want to really learn about these objective functions and the overall larger perceptual methodology. So avoiding getting confusions about these much more complicated classes is something we've done so far. So these are still some simple but okay yeah, almost out of time so perhaps I shouldn't mention that much about it. the Bayesian version that does learn a model of it. For example, the soft tree is an efficient way of calculating the mixture all of them instead of picking one. We, in other case, we use method of picking one, but before that, all the methods is MCIC version, where it has a class of complex trees, so it has those soft trees we saw, you can see that all of them, all of the MDPs based on such a state space, based on one such, and we can perform reasonably efficiently the mixture of all of those with a cursive procedure. And then he used exactly this QCT method to perform planning within that one, within that learned model instead. So we managed to solve a number of different games in that. So that also happens in these sort of cycles. They tend to do it every action. So they take an action, get an observation, update the Bayesian mixture with this formula, then based on counting things in various contexts, and then doing this recursive formula, doing UCT planning within that formula, doing simulation within, or sorry, model, within that model that performs forms his sampling, takes the best action on that, and then it keeps going within the disciples again. And we decided to make a comparison of these two, 
And I should say that MC Alpha version has stronger theoretical guarantees, but it has a pain of having to forward these simulations with cost a lot. And it ended up storing quite a lot of things to be able to form that full Bayesian mixture. So this is one domain where Pocman is Pacman but partial observable. You only see the immediate in line of sight. So if you at least have Pacman, what actually could see you, you don't have vision across from Pacman, but within the maze, within the Pacman maze. And here's some things, here's some comparisons we did. So the problem was that on our limited computer with 32 gigs, we we only managed to run the MCI accessing with 48 bits of possible memory backwards. We couldn't remember that far. Uh, but this lower one is the one we combined two learning with this learning of, of a, the feature vector control criteria. And we managed to do about as, as say comparable, a bit above that since that's just a random thing. So I think it's compar comparable to MCI accessing when it has 48 bits of memory. But we want to use 0.4 megabytes of memory instead of instead of much more, and MCRT has to be eating it up, but we, we do stay at some point. And we have a much simpler computer, but use much less time than that did. So on, on that task, it may have performed very well, though MCRT might be um, an even more reliable method on the Sunders theoretical foundations. But those, that Sunders get you a lot of cost. Both memory and computation is, is costing you quite a lot for, for getting that. And it's not a complete, complete unsound, but for the exact message we're doing, we don't have as nice guarantees as, as the MCIXs have it. So here's where we stand. So reinforcement learning is a very powerful paradigm which one can formulate all AI problems. So it's different between formulating the problem and solving it, but one can, to begin with, I think one can reach people can formulate the AI, the AI problem as reinforcement learning, not practice aggressive using model decision processes, but thinking about engineering problem reductions representation. It's a good feature map for that helicopter. It depends on choosing a big part of that success and really understanding how the, the physics of choosing a very good feature map for that task. So that's a big important part of it. What's on the goal results? You have very good results in front of generic things. We just split things up in three by three pieces across the whole thing doing various thing. It's been quite well. It gets an extra bounce by engineering features by hand, but it but it still gets a very, very good result can be to almost all human players basic generic stuff. Uh, the, the exciting thing for us with Kevin general intelligence is how this arcade gaming environment is really taking off. A lot of the top players of caring about solving this problem, being able to solve all 500 of our games, same algorithm, same parameters, so no particular game, tuning for particular games, trying to solve that. We're quite far from solving the whole thing, but there's some nice successes already in, in the first uh, three, four years. One has got quite a bit on the way of solving a reasonable chunk of the games in better than human performance, better than some human score. How good some, better than someone who spent some amount of effort at least on trying to play them without really being a, a gamer. And uh, also look at here on how one can share data across a lot of robots, for example, and how one in that case can improve the sample complexity dramatically by being able to share all these experiences of values and, that, and crowdsource that and be able to get all these, for example, House cleaning robots to learn together how to do that, do that job in a pleasing manner. So, thank you very much. As your environment gets more complex, it's more likely that there could be an arbitrary long delay before a reward. The reward could kick in and then stay forever, and so on and so forth. So, uh, do theorists in this area sort of feel that reinforcement learning uh, is never going to deal with that more complicated case, or do you sort of think that somehow there'll be a way of getting over that uh, that problem? Well, we were quite encouraged by how computer goes suddenly worked out. It looks so far from being solved to get even reasonable performance and now it beats almost all human players. And there's quite a few moves into the game before the reward comes at the end of the game. So there's quite a long delay in that case. So there's some hope in 
in that case, but but also these things where you can shape the rewards or teach it in some demonstration that we have have learned that some behaviors are good for getting reward much later on, and by teaching this, it seems to be a very effective way as as well. Just like we teach kids or each other a lot of things where the reward is some very far down the road, perhaps it's supposed to be 20 years later, right? Yeah. I think there's another uh, trick that has been proposed a long time ago that can do with what you're talking about, which is to uh, consider multiple time scales. So you know, even though it might be very difficult and very nonlinear to look at what happens at the smallest time scales in the far future, uh, if you look at events at more, in a more abstract, uh, slower time scale, or at a more abstract space of representation, then things may become feasible if the world has that kind of structure, of course. Yeah, that's a lot of people have been working on some kind of, some call it options or macro actions so or learning and utilizing them. They, they're very useful if you engineer them and give them to the agents. They're certainly useful. But well, we need to learn them. That's yeah, yeah that's, they're difficult to learn, easier to use. But there's some work in the uh, recurrentness literature trying to learn that kind of multi scale representation. Okay, I see some other work, not the RNN things. Is there a question? Or... Wh whose work are you thinking of? Mine. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> From the mid 90s. Okay. Yes. Have you looked at uh, reusing between the features or, you know, general strategies? And you know, to reuse strategies? Well, well, we learn that along the way, in this way, then you, then um, as long as they seem useful, one keeps them. One keeps it, one keeps the data, all data around, and and estimate one what features one choose based on that. Then keep what one learns around for a long time. Well, if it becomes useful for a very long time, then the complex dependence will come to win all of that. But if it now and then appears useful again, it's it some space around. I'm not sure if that is what you really mean. I mean, between different games. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry for transparent, yes. Yeah, that, that is something that many people believe that to be able to solve their part learning environment better, that one should somehow learn at a higher level across all the games, where not that, not just learn game by game, but learn the whole task together. With some, there been a lot of work on transfer learning so far. It's a difficult task, but probably quite necessary to be able to. To, to perform something well on these. Yeah. Well, I can probably formulate it at least as a hard patient method, but then the question is on the, on the practical amount to do it across, for example, these 500 yeah. at card games. But, but it, that is certainly something one needs. One needs to solve it to make a good, good method of this. And, and you could treat all the card game as one, because you have a feature vector, and the feature vector tells you what game, and the screen tells you what game this is. You don't need to have seen all the screens before you can walk in, someone play a game, you can walk in, they play in Space Invaders, you someone see the screen, you see me to the screen playing Space Invaders. So in a sense, you can treat as just one task, and just doing this across all of them at the same time, just much harder task. But you might not need other methodology to be able to do it, but there might be some gains in being able to separate, being able to say that this is a different component and this other thing, but you could do it together because you have the same feature vector for all of them, and the feature vector tells you honestly, on its own game you're in. Because it's a screen. Yeah. You had a statement there that almost all AI can be done with reinforcement learning. Would you care to speculate what are the what are topics which you cannot attack or with reinforcement learning? Mm -hmm. No, I could be a right almost you should write problem all or all that I can conceive of, so I don't have other examples, but I just don't want to rule out because I can conceive of other things. And so I don't have examples which I cannot form as a reinforcement some. Some people sometimes talk about the, the multi-objective version of it, but if you weight them together, then you get a reinforcement learning task, but sometimes people want to find the parade front for such things, so that is not 
directly within the Air Force without any advice for something, for example. So well, a different way to phrase a similar question would be which, which classes of problems important for AGI seem like they will be more difficult in practice to solve using reinforcement learning algorithms that are sort of moderate extensions of what we have today. I mean, of course, everything in principle could be formulated as a reinforcement learning problem, but that, that might, might or might not be practically useful in any given problem area. Yes, well, if you ask it in a very plain manner on reinforcement learning, you can get some very generic feature vectors, there's yeah. tons of things that would be very difficult, but it doesn't mean that reinforcement learning itself cannot be a component of it, while you just need richer learning and representation and, and such things, but it seems like most, well, I'm not sure if having a, a conversation bot is going to, based on generic reinforcement learning, passing the Turing test, I'm not that optimistic. I think you need to be a big part of that. Well, I mean, so going back to, say, Joshua Benji's talk from, from the other day, they were looking at this un unsupervised learning yeah. for, for building up representations. Now, in principle, one could use reinforcement learning together with representations built up by some unsupervised sort of pattern recognition, pattern formation type methods. But then reinforcement learning is part of the story, yeah. but there's another part of the story that is not, is not being done directly by a reinforcement learning method. Um, right, it's not being done by it, it's a part of the agent. So as, as your friend suggested, if you do computer reinforcement learning, put the reward signal as part of the observation that you're modeling, and then in a sense it's a model learning part of the reinforcement learning agent. So, so it's either, I mean, you think you think as a components and things, I think it was mathematical framework and then these other components are somewhere sitting inside performing the task. So it seems like in case it's, in one sense it's a different component. You know, another way it's a part of the agent. Just I mean, in principle, you could build those representations by reinforcement learning also, but it doesn't seem to be the practical way to do it at the moment. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure what I mean by it. Well, you could, put in the loss function as a reward. And, and well, it, but if you have a sequential structure of the whole thing, then perhaps you have not so much weight. The better part of using doing reinforcement learning or something like supervised learning tasks is you might have thrown away the ID assumption. You think it's all actually right, ID, it's probably useful, but if you're involved without ID stuff, we have not lost that much. So I think if you if you extend the, the work done in deep learning to uh, dealing with sequences, which is essentially mostly recurrent nets and things like that, then you're it's, it's getting very very close to what they're trying to do uh, with reinforcement learning. Yeah. Um, and now the rewards and the prediction errors are kind of the same currency. Yeah, yeah I think the the ETL lab with Schmidt Huber and when he worked with Dan Fiesta when he when he was there, I think they did some work on. It's mainly the policy gradients in that, in that case, but that's a more technical detail on how they try to estimate things. Right, so. All right, so if there's no more questions, we'll uh, proceed to our, our coffee and pastry break and re return for the keynote by uh, our friend Elizabeth Rose.